Good evening all. And tonight we have a subject very dear to my heart for two reasons. What I will be saying I have first-hand experience of. And I have spent the last 30 years of my life dealing with ownership of land. Usually trying to get people to transfer ownership so I could make a buck. <laughs> As a real estate broker here in California. Anyway, <clears throat> Um, the, um, I was prompted actually to choose this subject for tonight by uh, the, the, la the very, very last pages of a, a wonderful little book that Margaret picked up on the um, eBay. And it has nothing to do with the ownership of land, really, except that the author, Daryl Figgis, um, dealt with the, a document written by um, the Earl of Tyrone, uh, the great O'Neill, in a last effort in 1599 to make peace with Elizabeth. And reading it, I was struck by how well it described the old system, the old social system, and how deeply uh, the, the the relationship between the social system and the ownership of land was. Uh, so I, I started to think how central the ownership of land is to Ireland's history and how much of a chieftain and a, a great statesman O'Neill was to to zero in on that and recognize how, how central it, it was. And of course, for that very same reason, Elizabeth, on the other hand, rejected it out of hand, much like Maggie Thatcher with the out, out, out speech. <clears throat> um, she immediately recognized it and so did her conciliary, um, Cecil, for example, Lord Burley. They recognized right away the depth of significance that it had that it, that it had so that's why that's that's one of the reasons I, I chose it but um, we've talked about the land many times before but tonight we'll just talk about nothing else but it um, and if you can't you can't talk about land in ancient Ireland and I'm going to try if I can and go all the way up to modern times and speak about the Land Commission and the Land League and all the various land acts and so on. So hopefully I'll be able to connect all the the, the, uh, the Irish history in terms of, uh, of land ownership. Um, so if I get spend too much time on the ancient world, try and remind me of that so that I move, move forward. But you can't talk about the, the about land ownership in the ancient, ancient Ireland without a little talking a little about the Brehan laws, because the Brehan laws were uh, were comprehensive, uh, but of course a tremendous amount had to do with the ownership of land. So I'm going to because I made some notes today, and I might get more meaning out of it if I just read it. And what I, what I'll do is I'll have the liberty, claim the liberty to go off on my usual little tangents when I, when I go through the market throwing a rise in the air. Um, <clears throat> but, <laughs> but I like to do that. Uh, the Irish land-owning system was fundamental to Irish society. It survived the Norman invasion but did not survive the Tudor conquest. It survived the Norman invasion, by the way. Uh, well, I won't go into that. <laughs> for, many, for, for, for many reasons. Um, uh, one gained land by a delicate combination of inheritance and industry. Throughout all of Irish life, even a slave could actually raise himself above his station, thus moving up the social ladder. Ireland was de divided into roughly a hundred thuaha. Now, that hundred is probably very inaccurate, but just for... for, um, for um, to give you an idea, it, it wasn't a thousand, and it was more than a hundred, that sort of thing. Athua was the equivalent of a modern country. Uh, through its re, king, it gave each, each of its 
Tuhana or Ochach, which were citizens, various, lots of different names for people who lived there and their status within the, uh, which rep represented their, their various status within the, the, the Tua, um, the protection of its laws. An outsider was known as a Dori and technically had no legal rights. Even to this day, <laughs> they use, so you'll hear the word Dori used in country words, that he's a Dori. However, depending on one's rank or status elsewhere, certain rights were extended, but Dori, no matter how noble they were, were never quite trusted. And their, their, um, their oath, if you like, if they swore an oath against you, didn't have as much weight as if uh, a person of rank uh, in your own Thuaha did. Now, there was basically two kinds of people, uh, those who owned, huh? Oh, <laughs> what millennia were in, it's probably more accurate. <laughs> um, I'm everything before 10, before, before the 11th century in Ireland, before the, the conquest in England, 1066. So, uh, a thousand years ago and before is probably a good place to, to all up to a thousand years ago. Um, <clears throat> so, those who had some chance of becoming landowners and those who, quite frankly, didn't. Uh, but I'm not going to deal too much with the. I do have some uh, interesting stuff here uh, about the the different strat status of society. So probably a good idea to at least touch touch on it. The ladies will find it interesting that the lowest um, uh, status was a male slave, and the next one higher was a female slave. So a female slave actually had more value than a, a male slave because I guess she could procreate herself and she had other skills and so on. And yeah, uh, she she um, uh, so, so anyway, she was um, called uh, a cool, just like a C O, you know, like the kids say today, K C U M, shave ya, a l, a cool. Um, uh, by the way, male male slave was called a mug or a moog. So I guess that's where that expression comes from. Um, so <clears throat> uh, they could raise themselves up above their status, but it took it took it took work, and, and they had to have um, certainly some skills and some uh, some unusual attributes. Um, interestingly enough, for Jake as an aside, the uh, offspring of a slave woman held exactly the same status as the father. So that if she was impregnated by a nobleman, she she had it made, uh, which was extraordinary. Uh, was there, because well they had no concept of, of um, legitimacy or the Christian marriage as we understand it. So that certainly was one way for a cool to raise herself up, was to bed herself down with a, a nobleman, or even anybody above a few steps above her status, and uh, at least. Um, it was kind of like uh, a, um, an illegal alien having a children, a child in another country, and then sort of getting the, the, some of their status. But I don't want to go into too much into the um, the different uh, strata. But I want to go straight and start with there was a number of other uh, other um, uh, people. Yeah, together they were, they were known as Fudrha. And uh, there's still shades of Fudrhan and you know and Fudrha. We're sort of like the the, the, the non-landed people, the people who didn't have land. And of course, these were these were all non-noble. You know, the nobility then was at a trouble. So we're talking about all the people who, who um, lived below the, the nobility level. Um, now, <clears throat> the um, I'll get back to my little. Uh, little thingy here. Um, so, when I talk now about the first rung on the land ownership ladder by birth rather than by 
uh, Merit was a, a, ma a boy uh, known as uh, the Midba, Midba. Um, and that was at puberty, say 14. If he was ready to go out and fight uh, in an army, in the, the king's army, he was, and, and his, his father uh, was on the wrong to lather. He, he was uh, an Okara, and, or his grandfather more likely would be a Boara. Um, so I'm going to talk about those three, those three um, divisions, starting with the uh, Midba. Now, in Irish, Ba is like a hut. You'll often still hear the expression of Bahan. You know, a little hut would be referred to as Bahan, and so on. Um, 